Come on, if you love Jesus, make a little bit of noise this morning. It's so good to be here, and it feels like family every time I step into this place, and I'm so grateful for Pastor Tyrone. Probably known him close to 15 years now, and uh, he looks younger every year. And uh, he's been a spiritual mentor and really example to me, but I said this morning, you know, if you've been a part of church for more than five minutes, you know that it takes more than a pastor to run a church. It takes an army of volunteers, team, lay leaders, kids workers, musicians that come and rehearse to know the songs, people that are greeting people in the parking lot. And anytime that you experience a blessing publicly, it's usually because somebody has sacrificed privately. So can we take a moment to just thank God for every volunteer, every leader, every production worker. Come on, appreciate them. Amazing. Amazing. And I do want to show you a picture of my family really quickly. We went to the farm yesterday and we cut down our own Christmas tree. I felt really good about myself for doing that. Uh, don't ask me how long it took me to do it, but we got the tree. And uh, my wife and I have been married for 14 years. We've got two kids. We are in the process of adopting as well, so please pray for that. And uh, thank you. And we're excited, so I'm glad you're here today. Do you like who you're sitting next to? If not, just get up and move real quick. It's not too late. No, I'm kidding. That's messed up. Don't do that. I read this prayer the other day, and it struck me as humorous from this woman. She had just jotted this down on a prayer request card. It said this, Dear Lord, so far today I am doing all right. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined, cursed, or eaten chocolate. However, I'm going to get out of bed in a few minutes, and I will need a lot more help after that. <laughs> Listen, we laugh, but how many know that a lot of our prayers, if we're honest, are small prayers, sometimes selfish prayers, sometimes daily prayers. But I want to talk this morning about a different type of praying. I want to talk about praying for things that are humanly impossible. What are you believing God for that is bigger than yourself? What's on your list right now that you would be embarrassed to say out loud that you are praying for? I think one of the greatest tra tragedies of the people of God is that our prayers are too small. We got to stop praying just for that one struggling family member. I hope that they become a Christian. How about we pray for our entire family to encounter Christ this holiday season? How about we stop praying, just, Lord, give me enough money to pay the bills. I'm just trying to pay the bills. How about we pray for an abundance of resource so that we can be a blessing to other people? For us parents in the room, let's stop praying these cute little prayers before the kids go to bed. Lord, protect them. How about we pray that our kids would never settle for a career when there is a calling from heaven on their life? This is one of the greatest challenges that I've been walking through is I want to start thinking bigger and praying bigger. Let me encourage you with this verse in John 14. I love this. It says this. It says, you can ask for anything in my name. Somebody say anything. anything. Come on, you slept in. You weren't even at the early service. You better say it louder than that. Say anything, anything. in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. What is it that you are asking God for? Because in my opinion, the saddest verse in the Bible is the verse that says you have not because you ask not. What are you asking for? I remember hearing this story from my father many years ago that when he first told me it was hard for me to believe, I had to actually look it up to verify that it was true. But back in the 60s, my dad had a friend by the name of George Raveling. I'm going to show you a picture of my dad and George up on the screen. They're just having lunch, hanging out together. My dad's the one on the right, if you were wondering. <laughs> um, and believe it or not, in the 60s, George 
was at his house right outside of D.C., and it was the night before Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech. And George was hanging out with his friends, and his parents said to him, hey, there's something happening tomorrow at the National Mall. You and your friends should go and volunteer and help out. He said, all right, that sounds like a good idea. So they went there late the night before. They said, hey, we want to volunteer tomorrow morning. They said, sure, no problem. Show up here tomorrow, 7 a.m., we'll put you to work. So George and his friends show up the next morning at the National Mall. No idea that there'll be a million people there. No idea the historic proportions of what's about to take place. No idea that MLK is about to give a speech that we'll still be talking about today and in the history books. And you got MLK on the stage giving the speech, and George Raveling shows up that morning to volunteer. And the people in charge says, no problem. We're going to give you a responsibility today. You're actually going to be on the security team. How many know that times have changed quite a bit, right? First time volunteers on the security team, they said, you're going to be on the platform with all of the speakers. So George gets up on the stage with the speakers that day. And if you w watch the videos and you, you look back, there's probably 100 people on stage. There's a lot of people up there. So George is up on stage and MLK is up there and he's speaking to everybody and he's giving this sp famous speech that one day people won't be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And the crowd goes wild when MLK gets done and everyone on the stage is kind of shuffling around as the event is over. And my dad's friend George, 21 years old at the time, he bumps into Dr. King and he's face to face with him. And George says to Dr. King, Dr. King, that was a great speech. Dr. King says, thank you, young man. I appreciate that. And for whatever reason, George goes, can I, uh, can I have your speech notes? Dr. King reaches in his jacket and says, sure, and hands George his notes to the I Have a Dream speech. To this day, George Raveling, my dad's friend, still has those notes. Museums have offered him millions of dollars People have tried to negotiate with him, and he still has those notes. And I thought to myself when my dad told me that story, that is crazy. I was like, how did that happen? And the reality is, he just asked. <laughs> That's all he did. He just asked. I don't want to simplify it, but I'm just telling you, I don't want to get to heaven one day and God look at me and be like, why didn't you just ask? <laughs> I'd rather God say, you asked for too much. I'd rather hear that. What is it that you're asking God for? What is it that you're praying for? By a show of hands here, how many people here are believing God for something that has not yet happened in your life? Lift your hand. Okay. We're all in this together. I know that I have those things as well. But if we're honest today, the most difficult part of praying is not asking. It is continuing to ask. The most difficult part of praying is continuing to believe for the thing that you're praying for week after week, month after month, and year after year. Anybody can pray for something once or twice. How many know that it takes a real person of faith to keep on believing for that thing? Sometimes I ask myself, why is it that God answers certain prayers? and seems to not answer other prayers? Why is it that I can have a friend that's praying for the exact same thing and God seems to answer them before he answers me? It's almost mysterious why God answers prayer and when he answers prayer, but if you look at the scriptures, you can actually deduce certain reasons to why God answers prayer. First thing is this. If you're gonna get your prayers answered, you have to have faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we're praying out of religious obligation or we're just saying words on a Sunday morning, how many know those prayers aren't going to go past the ceiling? But the Bible says that when you pray in faith, anything is possible. There's something about an atmosphere of faith. I don't know about you. I don't need another song. I don't need another sermon. I don't need another church service. I need to get into the presence and power of God, get around the people of God in an atmosphere of faith, and I believe anything can happen. It takes faith. But it takes even more than faith. The Bible says that you have to pray in accordance with God's will. Because I could pray right now and say, 
in faith. I can say, let's all stand on our feet. Jesus, I pray that when I go out of this church service, that Toyota that I drove here, God, I pray in faith that it would be a Mercedes by the time I get to the parking lot. I believe it in faith. I have faith. Would, would God answer that prayer? I don't know. Bible says that you ask, or you, have, or, um, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own pleasures. So we have to pray in accordance with God's will. But then it's tough because you can be praying in faith. You can be praying God's will. But then there's a third little thing called God's timing. So you could have all the faith in the world and it could actually be God's will about what you're praying for. But how many know that God's plan is different than our plan? How many know that we're in a hurry but God's not in a hurry? How many know that he has a way of orchestrating everything in the perfect way and perfect timing? In a way that usually is in our best interest and for him to receive the most glory as possible. I want to show you my favorite woman in the Bible, and I think it's going to encourage you. We're going to learn a couple things, and then we're going to pray, we're going to worship, and we're going to get on our way. But I want to show you my favorite woman in the Bible. It's in Luke chapter 18. I want you to check this out, okay? Luke chapter 18, they're going to put it up on the screen. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Somebody say, never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I love this part, listen, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. No husband, say amen at that point, okay? I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people? Cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? When God in heaven looks down at New Jersey, when he looks down at Trinity, when he looks down at your life, he's looking for one thing and one thing only. Who has faith? Come on, anybody in here have faith that God can move today? I said, can anybody have faith that God can move today? The Bible says, according to your faith, so be it unto you. That's why some people can walk in church and you can ask them, how was the day? It was all right. You can ask somebody else, how was the day? God moved. What was the difference? Faith. <laughs> Look at the person on your right and say, do you have faith? Do you have faith? Look at the person on your left and say, stop talking to me. We're in church. I'm trying to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> few things, few things we can learn from this woman that I've been greatly encouraged by. The first is this. This woman had passion. This persistent woman had passion. There's a verse in 1 Kings that says, passion for God's house has consumed me. I have a conviction that the people of God should be the most passionate people in the world. We serve a God who died on a cross. Some people even refer to it as the passion of the Christ, the passion of the Christ. We, we, we have a God who is passion and has given us his spirit. If we call ourselves Christian, we should be more passionate than any person that we know, any football game, basketball game, baseball game. We are people of passion. To be a Christian without passion is an oxymoron. That doesn't even make sense. To be a Christian and not have passion is like having a Ferrari with no gas in it. It's like having a million dollars in your bank account, but you forgot the password. It's like a Krispy Kreme donut that's sugar-free, okay? It's all right, but it's not all that it was meant to be. This woman had unbelievable passion. She didn't sit at home and wait for her appointment at the courthouse. She went and found that judge to put her request in. In other words, she kind of went around all protocol because she was determined to see that her request was met. I love that about this woman. This is powerful. I remember a friend of mine not that long ago, he was a guy who worked in, in corporate and he was in Manhattan and 
He told me he was the only Christian at his job and he was having difficulty in the workplace and people were kind of making fun of him, giving him a hard time and stuff like that. And he said to me, man, I just got so sick of it one day. He goes, I started to change what I was doing. I said, what'd you do? He goes, well, I got to be at work at 8 a.m. every day. He goes, so I started showing up at 7 a.m. before anybody got there. And I just started laying my hands on every single chair, praying over my coworkers, praying over that cubicle, praying over my boss's office, praying over the atmosphere of my entire workplace. He goes, all of a sudden, not after one day, not after one week, but after a couple months of doing that, guess what? All of a sudden, the atmosphere started to change. All of a sudden, people started to ask me questions. All of a sudden, I started praying for people. All of a sudden, I started inviting them to church, and they started coming and giving their hearts to Christ. Why? Because somebody got passionate. You're wondering if and when are my prayers going to get answered. Try getting passionate. This woman had an unbelievable amount of passion. Second thing I love about this woman is this woman, this is a hard one, okay? They're going to get harder as we go. This woman was willing to participate in her prayers being answered. She was willing to participate in her prayers being answered. What do I mean by that? It says that she went to the courthouse time and time again. Now, when we think of a courthouse, we think of a brick-and-mortar building downtown. I'm not going to ask how many people have been to the courthouse, but it was not a brick and mortar building downtown. In ancient Israel, the context of this scripture is that a courthouse was actually a mobile tent that was set up and torn down and moved to different locations without giving anybody notice. This is not only important, this is impressive. She would get up in the morning and she would go to the courthouse and if the courthouse was not where it was the day before, she would go figure out and find that courthouse. This tells you that she was participating in her prayers being answered. She was not just sitting at home passively saying one prayer and sitting on her couch saying, all right, God, do what you're going to do. I already prayed about it once. Whatever happens, happens. No, she was getting up and she was moving. She was willing to participate in her prayers being answered. The reason why this is so hard for us, because if we're honest, those of us that have been in church for a while, a lot of times we say that we want miracles, but what we really want is magic. We want God to just wave his magic wand from heaven and just fix whatever it is he's going to fix. Lord, I need financial breakthrough. God, I pray that you rain down cash from heaven. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, God, come through for me. And God's like, how about you get a budget? Lord, I'm so sick of being single. God, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Lord, send me a spouse. Send me a spouse. God's like, ask them on a date. It's getting real quiet in here, Pastor Tyrone. We like it when God just waves that magic. Lord, use me. You, you can do anything with my life. Sign up the volunteer. <laughs> Are you willing to participate in the very prayers that you're believing God to answer? God wants to do his part, but he wants us to do our part. We have to do the natural. God will do the super, and it turns into supernatural results. This is what happens. I was out to dinner not that long ago with two friends. I was in Chicago, and one of the friends was a very wealthy individual, and the other friend was not a wealthy individual. And my not-so-wealthy friend was talking about how he feels called to be generous but he was like, I don't have that much resource, so I've never been able to give a lot of money, so I'm just generous with my time and my talent, you know, but I really feel like God's gifted me to be generous. And this wealthy friend was kind of listening, and we had a great conversation that night. About a week goes by, and my friend calls me, and he goes, he goes, bro, remember, remember, remember that dinner the other night and the conversation we had, and, you know, we were out with our other friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, he goes man, my, my friend, he came by the office that day. The, the wealthy friend, he goes, he came to my mom. I said, what happened? He goes, man, he sat down across from my desk, and he started talking to me. He started encouraging me. He started prophesying over me. He started telling me, I do have the gift of generosity. Then he reached in his back pocket, and he pulled out $1,000 cash, and he put it on the desk. How many want to believe God for a friend like that, okay? <laughs> he puts the $1,000 on the desk, and he says, listen, this money is for you, but it's not for you. I want you to take this money. 
And over the next seven days, whenever the Holy Spirit tells you to bless somebody, I want you to bless somebody. You have the gift of generosity, and this week, what you're going to do is you're going to strengthen your generosity muscles. I love that. This was a guy that could have just sat at that dinner and said, oh, yeah, 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 great story. No, no, he said, I'm going to do something about this. This young man is praying and believing that he has the gift of generosity. How can I participate in seeing this prayer answered? We have to be willing to participate in our prayers being answered. We have to be willing to listen to what it is that God wants us to do. And the last one is this, and I find this to be the most difficult, and then we'll pray. Is this woman in Luke chapter 18, she was able to persevere through all circumstances. How long have you been praying for that thing that you've been praying for? I don't know what you lifted your hand about. Maybe it's been months, maybe it's been weeks, maybe it's been years. Maybe you're praying for a child that's away from God and you want them to come back to God. Maybe you're praying for a dream that God put in your heart and it's been so long you've lost hope and you're like, I don't know if this thing's ever gonna happen. Maybe you're praying for a relationship or a loved one that's become fractured and you want that relationship to be restored. and You feel like you've tried everything you've, can, you've could and if you're honest today, you say, I stopped praying about it. I got so tired of it, I stopped praying. I'm so sick of waiting, I stopped praying. I'm so overcome with doubt and fear about the whole thing, I stopped praying. This woman, it says that she repeatedly came to the judge day after day after day. We don't know if it was three months. We don't know if it was three years. We just know that she kept on believing. She kept on praying. When she didn't feel like it, she prayed. When other people stopped praying, she kept praying. No matter what was going on, she continued to persevere through every single circumstance. We all know the verse, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be answered to you. But look at Matthew chapter 7, 7. I love what the next verse says. It says this, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. There's something about a Christian that just keeps on keeping on. People that have the ability to persevere. This is hard for us because... We're becoming more and more impatient. I don't know if this has ever happened to you before, but have you ever texted somebody? And if they didn't respond within like five minutes, you're like, why are you ignoring me? Why are you ignoring me? Right? Technology has made us more impatient. But if we're not careful, that impatience can trickle its way into our spiritual life. And we can pray. And if God doesn't answer us within five minutes, we say, why are you ignoring me? Why are you ignoring me? But how many know you can't Google a response from God. The things of God take time. In fact, the greatest things in life and the greatest things in the spirit take the longest amount of time. In fact, we could do a whole other message on waiting. And I would suggest to you that th those who God makes wait the longest, he blesses the most. That's a whole different message. God is not the God of technology. This is why the Bible gives so many examples of farming, of agriculture, which is hard for our New Jersey minds to conceptualize. And I'm not a farmer, but I know that farming requires three things. It requires planting, it requires watering, and it requires waiting. And then more waiting. And then more waiting. <laughs> And then more watering. And then more waiting. I can imagine those farmers getting frustrated thousands of years ago, looking down at the ground saying, why is nothing growing? I've been doing all the right things. And I've been waiting. I've been watering. I've been planting. I've been doing all the stuff the farmer is supposed to do. And nothing is coming up out of the ground. And if we're honest, a lot of us look at our life like this. And we can get frustrated and say, why is nothing growing? Why isn't the relationship growing? Why isn't the ministry growing? Why aren't my finances growing? Why isn't it getting better? Why isn't it changing? I've been coming to church. I've been praying. I've been singing the songs. I've been believing, and nothing is happening. 
And perhaps this is why the word of God says don't ever get tired of doing good because at just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. Come on, if you believe that, why don't you put your hands together today? It doesn't say that you might reap a harvest of blessing. It says that you will reap a harvest of blessing. See, that's the difference between hope and faith. Hope is believing, or hope is, you know, thinking, oh, God can do something. Faith is believing that God will do something. It's a different type of confidence. It's a different type of belief. I'm going to have the keys come back up, and the worship team's going to get ready to lead us again in just a moment. By the way, I'm grateful for this worship team. Are you thankful for every musician, every singer? Come on, they're doing an awesome job. They're going to come up here. And I want to just share this as well. It's just coming to my mind, but just to encourage you that his plans are perfect and his timing is never off. I remember once again I was in, where was I? I was in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I had to be at a conference in Chicago at 9 o'clock in the morning. It was a three-hour drive, so I got up at 6 a.m., got in my car to take the drive, and all of a sudden I hit traffic, and I saw those signs on the highway, you know, those demonic signs that say delays ahead. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> saw one of those, construction, there was an accident, started raining. I mean, everything that you could run into, I ran into. My three-hour drive turned into a four-hour drive. So I'm, you know, annoyed with myself. I'm mad. I should have left earlier. I'm going to be an hour late to the conference. Started at 9. I walk in at 10 a.m. I go into the church lobby. Somebody's there, hey, Todd, so good to see you. Thanks for coming. I said, I'm so sorry. I got caught in traffic and then this and then that. I know I'm an hour late. I'm so sorry. And the person looked at me and they said, what are you talking about? You're not an hour late. I said, it's 10 o'clock. I started at 9. I'm an hour late. They said, oh, no, 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 no. You didn't realize that when you drove from Indianapolis to Chicago, you drove through a time zone. We're one hour behind. You're actually right on time. <laughs> How many know where I'm going with this? God is going to get you to exactly where he wants to get you, no matter what delay you have to fight through. And you're going to look around and realize, you know what? I'm actually right on time. Why? Because his plan is perfect and his timing is never off. Our job is to keep praying, to keep believing. Believe for salvation over that person. Believe for that dream to come true. Believe for financial breakthrough. Believe for that door of opportunity. Believe for growth. Believe for healing. Whatever you're believing for, you got to keep believing. You've got to keep praying. I'm going to have you stand to your feet. We're going to pray in just a moment and sing, but stand up for a second and worship team, you can do whatever you feel. But as you're standing, just look at me for a quick second. I'm passionate about this message of persistent prayer because I'm a product of persistent prayer. See, when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, I was away from God. I was away from church. I was caught up in a party culture, drinking, drugs, unhealthy relationships, all these different things. But while I was out partying, I had a mom that was at home praying on her knees for the salvation of her son. Come on, how many know you can never underestimate the power of a praying parent, the power of a praying grandparent? Come on, let's be honest. Some of us, the only reason we're in this building is because somebody prayed you into the kingdom of God. <laughs> somebody prayed you into the kingdom of God. And I guarantee you there was a moment where it looked hopeless. Guess what they did? They kept praying. There was a moment where it got worse. They kept praying. There was years that went by where you were flooded with disappointment and doubt and overwhelmed, and that person kept praying. There's something powerful about continuing to pray. 2,000 years ago, we know this, Jesus, he dies on a cross, buried in a grave, rises again. He spends a few days on earth. He gathers his disciples together. He says, listen, we're going to have a meeting 
how to take over the world. This is an important meeting. Don't want to be late to it. They come to the meeting. He says, why don't you just wait for the Holy Spirit to come? That group of people might have looked similar to what this room looks like. They gather into a place called the upper room. They start praying. Not one day, not two days, not three days, 10 days. They start praying. They start praying. They start praying. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes. All of a sudden, they start preaching their first sermons. All of a sudden, 3,000 people are baptized. And check this out. All of a sudden, the Christian church is started. And here we are, thousands of years later on a Sunday morning in New Jersey, in this church, worshiping God. Why? because we are literally a product of their prayers. It's the only reason we're here. Come on, can we thank God that he is a generational God? But my question to you is this, who's gonna be a product of your prayers? What's gonna be a product of your prayers? I ask you to close your eyes all over this place and if you're here today and you would just simply say, this message is for me. I needed to be reminded today to keep on praying. If that's you, would you just lift your hand so I can see? If that's you, all those places, amazing, amazing. Listen, if you're comfortable, those that lifted your hand, I'm gonna ask you just to come forward to the front of this room so we can pray with you, pray for you. Come on, step out of your seat, whether you're in the back or the front, all the way up here to the front. There's nothing magic about the front of the room, but there's something supernaturally significant about stepping out of where you are and stepping into where you believe that God is taking you. So come all the way to the front of the room. All the way to the front of the room. Let's close our eyes all over this place. and We're going to sing this out and then we're going to pray together. But come on, let's worship for a moment like we believe God. Come on, let's stir our faith all over this place. Jesus. Come on, don't just sing it, pray it. If you're comfortable, you can lift your hands. Open your heart, open your mouth. Jesus, we welcome you in this place. Jesus from the mountains 
the streets. She's the thing the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the whole. about to pray we're not just going to talk about praying we're going to pray in the book of acts it says that the church was all gathered together and they lifted their voice together in prayer so listen 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 this is what we're going to do this is what we're going to do one of the most powerful things that you can do when you're believing god for breakthrough is to pray for somebody else's breakthrough we're going to take just 30 seconds before they just sing that again and whoever's on your right Maybe you know that person, maybe you don't know that person. You're going to pray one thing and one thing only. You're going to lift your voice and you're going to pray for breakthrough in that person's life. I don't know if it's a son or a daughter coming back to Christ. I don't know if it's healing in somebody's body. I don't know if it's a door of opportunity. I don't know if it's a financial miracle. The Holy Spirit will translate. All you got to do is open up your mouth and pray with everything you got for that person on your right. And I want you to pray for breakthrough like this is a family member. Come on, on the count of three, we're gonna lift up our voices all over this place, even people that didn't come for, and we're gonna pray for breakthrough before we sing this again. When we sing, we'll sing. Right now, we're gonna pray. Come on, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and just pray for breakthrough. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, doors opening. Sons and daughters coming back. Miracles on the job. Jesus. Breakthrough in relationships. Restoring marriages in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. Jesus, 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 Jesus.
Father, thank you. Thank you for a message in season, God. Thank you for the parable that Jesus would give, that story that illustrates the truth. And thank you, Lord, for reminding us about passion, participating, but that component of persevering is what we need, God. You make all things beautiful in your time, and Lord, would you just help us to trust your timing, God? so grateful lord for just a word in season for us and now god that we've prayed we're praising you because we believe that it is done god in the time in which you've chosen god and so we're going to believe you for it now god whatever the breakthrough is oh god whatever that addiction was oh god whatever it may be the person we're believing that you're going to bring back restore relationships lord providing income oh god as we go and do what he called us to do as we get the budget together as we go get the job oh god whatever it is we're grateful lord that we've knocked and the door will be open god that we have looked and we have found god that oh god as we waited on you you would do what it is you said you would do so lord now just continue to have your way in our lives and that's what we're saying in jesus name come on let's put our hands together and just say amen amen Amen. What was the title of today's message? Because I know it's different than this morning. What was the title? The hardest part of praying. So here's what I want to encourage all of you from all the way around here in the back, all of us. Okay, two things. I want you to, number one, listen to the message that he preached this morning. Okay, very important. You listen to that message as well. He talked about the importance of hearing the voice of God. And we start, first and foremost, with the Word of God, the Bible. So we're gonna, we, we did a challenge for this morning service, and that is for the next seven days, hopefully you go longer than that. But before we look at stocks or before we look at CNN, before we look at Facebook, Instagram, we're going to open our Bibles. Keep it by your, the side of your bed, whatever, or on your phone. But the first thing we're going to do, God, speak to me. Read a proverb a day. Remember, a proverb a day keeps stupidity away, right? So read a proverb a day. But then also, now, what we want to do is whatever we're believing for, hold on, please, back there. Whatever we're believing God for, we're going to keep praying. We're going to open our word and we're going to pray. And we're not going to stop praying until God comes through. We're going to be just like that lady. How many say amen? Can we thank God for the word that we heard here today? I want you to do me a favor. We don't get them often, so we're going to bombard them today, okay? Would you just go over, if you were blessed by his message, give him a fist bump. Tell him God bless you. And also, I want you to turn to seven people, all right? Seven people and just tell them, keep on praying. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs>